Some looking guy here. So he's actually an Italian guy. Uh, he's a lecturer at University of Naples Federico II in Italy. He is currently doing his uh, PhD under the field of wire arc additive manufacturing, WAAM process. And uh, uh, in Europe or in UK, they have to do one year attachment. So he's doing his one year attachment with UOW Australia. So he's a bit of Italian, a bit of Australian, now a bit of Malaysian. <laughs> okay, so today his guest lecture will be on machine learning as tool to support additive manufacturing certification process and application to wire arc additive manufacturing. So I will, without further delay, I will pass the floor to Julio to give his sharing session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, of course, it's an honor to be here today. Uh, thanks to Nisha to give me the possibility to be here, to the professor, to every one of you that you're going to attend today. Um, I'm going to present you some boring stuff regarding the certification process of any manufacturing. Uh, I say boring because you know there is no really an answer to solve this problem. Uh, but before to start, just have a look about my place. I come from Italy, of course, but maybe in the best part of Italy. I'm speaking about the south of Italy. And my city is Naples. Naples is maybe, uh, let me say, uh, the best city in the world, of course, for me especially. We invented the pizza. And as you can see in the picture, here is a gorgeous place. It's unbelievable. Uh, my institution is the old, oldest public university in the world, you know, established in 124, so very, very old. But everything is old as in Europe, as you know. know. And my university is a very important institution. And we are here just to give you an idea where we from, where I from. So, uh, first of all, which is, what, what, is, what is the meaning of certification? What is the meaning of qualification? Usually, the people used to use these two words to me to me to refer to the same stuff. Okay, but in reality, there are there is a, a slight difference between the qualification process and the certification process because the qualification process uh, is related to all the stuff that you have to do to answer to this question: Are you being the part right? And what I mean, right? I mean, are you, are you following all the standards, the quality standards that introduce this part? Are you employing standardized machine, standardized process, and blah, blah, blah? So it's something that is related to everything that is not that uh, is around the process. As most of you know, a process is a mix of metallurgy, robotics, it's not just it's a multidisciplinary staff. And to get the qualification, you have to demonstrate that your system in each part is able to follow the standards. Certification instead is another staff, maybe it's the most critical staff, because it's a some, in some point is field specific, because that is the answer to this question. Are you build the part, the right part? You are not just building the part right in the right manner, but are you building this part with the intent uh, to reach the design requirement of the part? If you are speaking about aerospace uh, field, because I mostly used to work in the aerospace sector, uh, there are heaps of many of uh, requirements that are very, very important to follow, no? because otherwise if a, if a client is going to follow, people used to die. No? It's, so uh, it's not just something related to the process, but it's something related to the part. Now, uh, usually organization uh, of standards, industry and research institutes used to work together to define the standards that, that people must follow to develop uh, 
qualification process. I mean, this machine is qualified, this process is qualified, this parameter are fine, blah, blah, blah. And the qualification standards that are, at the end of the day, rules that you have to follow to be uh, the part right, in the right manner. So again, to this question. Um, they are going to work all together to develop this, uh, any, uh, this standard. Now, which is the rule of a research institute? Because we are going to work in research environment, we are going to work very a lot with industries, maybe less with organizations, some other organization company, but no, in some way uh, we are working with industry. Which is the, uh, the, the goal of the research institute? The goal is try to push our research to, uh, to create these three stuff that are the key ingredients of the qualification and certification process. So first of all, maybe is know-how, or, or better, the knowledge. The first step that we must do is just change process parameters, explore how all the process parameters we are going to use to develop a part, how they can be used effectively to develop a part, no? which is the influence of each parameter to the final part in terms of mechanical properties, Thermomechanical properties, electrical properties, whatever. So the knowledge. But we have also to create the know-how for the industry because we have to write paper, 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 paper because it's our job. But we have not just to spend time to just because we have to publish. We have to create the knowledge that the industry must use to create the know-how. So the practical knowledge, at the end of the day, we are going to explore all the process parameters, try to get to be uh, a very good understanding of our process and working with industry to develop the know-how. I mean, just making it work in an industrial setting. And at the end, this is really related to the stage of technologies. I mean, maybe one a technology is, a technology is new, we have to create knowledge at the beginning after we have to spend time to create know-how, and at the end of the day we have to create a trust. But maybe it's the most important part of the certification and qualification process, because also if you created, invented, or set it up a very robust process, you must, in some way, force the industry people to believe in your process. You have to create the trust, so it is maybe the most difficult stuff. The trust. So, just to give you an idea of which are the uh, standards, uh, organization that are working on the Adri Manufacturing uh, Standards generation, there are, and of course, every, every organization, uh, they have their own uh, standards that you can download from the pages. Maybe at the end of the lecture, I'm going to be to share with you the slide, and you can use the link here just to reach these some pages, in which you can find you can find the, the standards. Because sometimes university uh, universities have access to the standard. I'm not sure because, for example, uh, in my institution, I have access to just some standards, not to everyone. Then it's by one, very one in the world. So every organization used to work with a such is to, to create standards. I mean, you have to create this part, you have to use these first parameters, uh, the machine must be follow this criteria, and blah, blah, blah. But the standards are just the first part of everything, because this is the part of qualification. But the most important is the certification, because qualification is a sort of hint, suggestion that you have to follow to create something. But qualification, the certification at the end of the day is the, the last part in which you, someone is going to say, okay, this part is compliant, you can fly with this flight, with this part, blah, blah, blah. And there are some companies that are called, let's say, for testing, uh, inspection, and certification companies like Vero Veritas or Dent Noske Veritas that are some of these big companies. That at the end of the day, come in your, in 
yo manufacturing plants and they're going to say, okay, let me check what you are going to do, let me check the part, at the end of the day they release you a certification that you can use to sell your part to the industry and get money. Uh, so several standard organization, several TIC companies, the TIC companies they are most filter related. For example, the Bureau of Editors is the, the TIC companies that you used to work in aerospace and any sector. And they, for example, develop some standard for my technology, that is the wire additive manufacturing or direct energy deposition arm, for example. And here, for example, the Detonos Vegas is a tech company that mainly work in energy and renewable energy. So, uh, this is the end of my boring stuff, just uh, very, very important part. Just to give you this suggestion, that is the suggestion that others has actually given to me, is just when we are going to work, trying to uh, develop even a research, uh, we have to focus more on trust. Because maybe the most important stuff is to create trust in that technology. Because otherwise nobody is going to use it. That's the point, no? Uh, maybe you can think as a trust, like you know, a house that you have to to be case study of after case study after case study after case study. Because if you are not going to develop any case study of your application, at the end of the day, that just remains something that is written in an international journal. And that's it. So, which, is, which are the challenges of the certification for the in manufacturing? That's the boring stuff, no? Because no one ever uh, an answer for that. Me neither. I have no answer for that. Uh, but just to report what I saw in the last um, Asian Pacific Atlantic Manufacturing Conference that was in Sydney last month, this is a sort of short uh, summary of uh, two days of speaking about certification, let me see. So maybe the, the, the first challenge is the repeatability of the manufacturing process, also the, especially for the metal one, because you are metallurgists, some of you are metallurgists, you know better than me that metallurgy is a very strange process, complicated, sometimes it's stochastic, or better, maintain the same environmental condition is very difficult. And especially for other manufacturing, in which the raw material is going to, some, uh, to, uh, to receive several metal transformations fusion, resolvification, blah, blah, blah. So maybe that BD maybe is the most tricky part of the manufacturing processes. Um, now there is also an idea of Rido uh, because there are a lot of parameters that you, you can do. It's, sometimes it's also to understand which, which are the really uh, consequences or change of some parameters to define a uh, mechanical policy of a part. Another problem, problem is a rapid innovation because since every day someone is coming is going to propose a new item manufacturing technology, be complicated just focusing on just one technology at a time. So today we are speaking of plastic, tomorrow we are speaking of biocomposite materials, tomorrow we are speaking of metals, the day after again different metals, high entropy, low whatever. So it's complicated, it's, you know, it's going to not, of course, not speeding up the process. It's going to slow down the certification process. And at the end, the, the other manufacturing parts, they used to be, they used to possess a very complex geometry. So it's complicated to inspect uh, other manufacturing parts because inside there be a lot of empty or strange geometry stuff inside. And all the uh, non disruptive testing that were developed in the past, they were fitted for different processes. So sometimes it's complicated to use the product of the And then in the end, the problem, maybe it's for my part, because I use more related to machine learning, uh, there is an insufficient, insufficient in situ real time monitoring of uh, the machines. There are people used to work, and you work a lot with the manufacturing stuff. But no one, no everyone collected data from the process, or if they collected data, they just give for themselves. 
we didn't share the data with no one. We have not really this strong historical uh, knowledge of what's happening in all the people around the world. No, so it's co really complicated. And nowadays, also because maybe it's not going to be cheap, just develop in situ monitoring stuff in a policy because we have to put the sensor and blah blah blah. Not every machine possesses the ability to uh, to collect data. So tricky, tricky, very complicated. Uh, so now, which is the, the the machine learning in all this story? Which could be the rule of machine learning? Should be a big here. My guy have a very bad connection. Uh, I said before that non distributed testing in general uh, is the methodology used to detect uh, or evaluate flows, materials, defects, or something that looks like a defect. And maybe, oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, in this video, there was you know, a guy that used to inspect a final component with ultrasonic test. Uh, and said it is not going to, not going to see, but essentially we have just a tool that you have to, uh, to pass through the part and after you have to collect some information. And the problem is that it's tricky because it's a very slow process. Uh, if the part has a, job, a simple shape, it's very easy also to, to develop an automatic uh, non test analysis. But when the geometry is going to be complicated with a lot of proof shape, it's going to be tricky, believe me. Uh, so as I, as I said before, general NDT can be used for any manufacturer. They can be used for every standard manufacturing processes. But the problem is that they were not thinking, think, thinking to, for this job. So if you have uh, sensors that are going to collect all the data that are coming from the whole process, maybe, and, and if you know uh, which are the parameters or the trend of these parameters during time that lead to, that, lead, that give you the possibility to develop a component without the effect, you can collect all this data day after day, day after day, day after day, for one month, for two months, which are going to be the component, be the component, be the component, get information, get information, get information about which is the meaning of a good deposition or a good final component. And at the end of the day, what you can do, you can develop complicated uh, anomaly detection modules, you can use anomaly detection algorithms to detect anomalies in the data. If you think that all manufacturing processes nowadays, especially in manufacturing, is robot, is robot designed. So you have a robot, the, the, and you can get the position of the robot during the deposition. The robot is going to be a component, and you know exactly where is the robot in each 10 step you know, of the deposition. You can collect, you can uh, collect this information, and uh, create a, a, a more huge data base which you have the exact two center point of the robot in the position and all the sensor data that come from the process. And you can know exactly when an anomaly occurs, when, when occurs, and especially when. So if you, if you are able to collect data from the process, understand all the technical anomaly, and know where this anomaly happened, you can use this point like target non-distributive test or better, better non-distributive evaluation. So you can be, you can say, okay, it's time to take the the ultrasonic tool and go around the components everywhere. You can say, okay, maybe we have to look just in, in this point. So in this point, I'm not okay. That's the rule of machine learning. I mean, in our perspective perception. So we. Any questions so far? Now I use connection. Uh, where is that there? Who's the connection in shot?
uh, which again helped me with the connection because I lost the connection and I thought they want to, to share the slide anymore. <laughs> Uh, yes. I don't know if you have more uh, hotspot. Yeah, hotspot, it's better. Uh, sorry. My hotspot, but one of the ten, no, uh, no enough uh, GBA to do that. Okay, so uh, just to make it to, to make up, our idea uh, of my research group is in Australia meaning fabrication, facility for intelligent fabrication research group in Australia and the UNW, so your friends down under, is that we can collect data from the process in terms of sensors, in terms of flow of position, and we can identify some targets for it or some targets part of our geometry in which we can use non destructive evaluation techniques to see if a defect is inside the map. That's uh, where the machine learning comes useful. So machine learning, most of you know that is a set of optimization techniques that are used to, define, to discover complex non-linear patterns in the data. Okay, so the idea is that you can extrapolate information from your data without just know how. The machine is going to, to learn it from you. Machine learning could be the, the could be the could be seen is three trees composing three different parts, that is unsupervised, supervised, and enforcement learning. And uh, supervised learning techniques usually consist in classification or regression, in which the idea is to try to create a relationship between some input data to a discrete output or a label, let me say, or a continuous variable, if you guys going to speak about regression, that consists of your prior knowledge of Clustering techniques instead are unsupervised learning techniques in which the idea is just to define patterns between data. You have no labels connected with your data. Uh, some example, example of machine learning application in industrial environment would be this one the helicopter that comes from some of my past research work. For example, for the aerospace sector, we did some drilling of composite materials. We collect the data respect to uh, the force during the drilling, the torque, uh, acoustic emission and vibration during the drilling process. And we extracted some statistical feature from this data, like this one. As you can see here, there is also the end of the first, the first plate at the start of the second plate of composite materials. With a microscope, we saw at the end of which drilling, which, which was the wheel of the tool. And the other day, we correlated this information with the tool wheel. 
So we developed a sort of online methodology that gives us the possibility to develop predictive maintenance application, just estimate, estimating the, the two wheel of the tool and just change it when it's going up, uh, down some, some uh, threshold value. Another this is an example of regression problem because the two wheel was measured in millimeters. In classification example is then you can, for example, maybe say, uh, classify the state of your machine. In this case, we had a wire cutting manufacturing robotic, robotic process. These are some images taken by the melt the room of the process. And we were able to correlate the images that, that we collected by a welding camera with the state of the process. Of course, if the sun spattering were cool, or if the robot was spent, normal deposition. Uh, another application could be, for example, dynamite detection. This is useful for NDA estimation. In this case, what we did was just deposit a lot of layers of wire cutting manufacturing process, and we got some data like this one. No? Like this one. No? In the end, after more than 100 de deposit layers, more than 100 deposit a layer, we were able to compare what come from the process and by that with what the machine used to expect as normal behavior and just develop some uh, more software modules that were able to say to us, be careful here, maybe there is a bad deposition. Okay? If there is a very bad deposition, maybe some defects inside, you know, and here all good, okay? normal deposition. So uh, the machine learning, the workflow that you have to follow to develop a machine learning application is the same any time for any kind of application, clustering, classification, analysis then it's, it's the same. So everything starts by retrieving data from collecting data from your process. Once you collect the data from your process, you have to clean this data, transform this data, and after train the model and evaluate the model itself. So, uh, some suggestion, once you're going to collect some data from your process, the first suggestion is try to uh, collect balanced data set. I mean, if your task is to develop a classification problem, let me say you want to classify the defects that occur during a deposition process, it's really important that you have the same amount of samples of the same category of defects. That's what I mean for balanced data set. Otherwise, the algorithm is going to be biased. Um, if some missing values are present in your in your data, your data set, you have to exclude these uh, these missing values from your data set because in a real industrial environment, it's not uh, true that you are going to collect data anytime. Sometimes the sensor are going to be broken, you have to substitute the machine are going to stand, so I'm going to miss some information. So another stuff that you have to take, take in mind is just, okay, uh, try to deal with these missing values using imputation methods or just execute these samples from the data. Once you collect the data from your process, you have to pre-process the data. This means that you have to, for example, conduct time series analysis, uh, noise rejection, rejection techniques, you have to standardize data, normalize data, and, and you have, for example, extract futures from it, select the future, ipsos after them. Suddenly we have no time to discuss about all these kind of processes, suddenly, but it's just a guideline. When you finish with the data processing, what you have to do is just use different data set. So, I mean, different features extracted in different way, manipulated different manners, and use different data set with heaps of algorithms. Let me say 10 different algorithms. At the end of the day, you have to tune some hyperparameters and just use the model that gives you the higher preferences. You're using, you know, comparison, uh, comparison uh, exploring analysis. And is just a trial and error approach. You just try some parameters, sometimes some data set, 
Try to use normalized data set, try to use standardized data set. At the end of the day, you have to select the best, the best, uh, the best references. So, just going to the end, because maybe I'm, I'm supposed to finish my time, so you give me uh, for speaking. Let's present an application about wire cutting and tapping. Okay? I, sp I spoke about certification process. I told you that it's a very important stuff. Uh, we spoke about machine learning a bit, and we say that maybe using machine learning we can detect targets for non destructive evaluation of additive manufacturing parts. So, how develop an application? Okay, this is the case study. What are additive manufacturing? It's an additive manufacturing process based on welding. I hope that all of you know what is welding process, and of course, the students. But in general, the idea is just deposit a layer after a layer of welding, like a multipass weld, not starting very far uh, from, from the head, with a robotic platform. And at the end, you are going to get a component that is, has very poor surface properties, because it's just a deposition of several welding layers, uh, one on top of another. And uh, this process needed to do a post processing at the end because you have to machine the final component to get the final uh, tolerance, joining the tolerance and stuff. So it's a very interesting process because it reduces the cost related to adding manufacturing of metal spar. Because the wire, the, the wire, metal wire using it for welding is very cheap respect to the powder. If you are going to use a uh, powder based process. And you can be very large parts, you can have very high deposition rate because you can deposit also 4 kilograms of materials per hour. So it's insane. The people used to develop big uh, bridges in the Netherlands, for example, I used to work with a company from a research perspective that used to, to develop a, a, a bridge in Amsterdam that is completely with them. Uh, the effect in, in uh, wire cutting manufacturing process are the same the effects that occur during a welding process. So, like of the of penetration of each layer in the uh, wire, cracks, porosity, spatter everywhere, final, uh, high final uh, distortion of the parts. So, okay, the costs are very, very low compared to, compared to power base technology, but we have a lot of defects that are going to we are going to get. And all of them are related to the process parameters used. That mainly are the, the welding voltage, the welding current that define the electric energy supplied to the materials, that is converted to heat, and the torch velocity. That the three most, parameter, uh, most important parameters of this process. And if you are not going to carefully do these parameters, you are going to get, of course, one of the same. The problem of, of welding with respect to the laser is that it's a very stable parameter used to fluctuate a lot during the deposition in the same manner for stochastic reason also sometimes. So here the machine learning is very useful because to analyze a welding data you need for an expert. I'm really, really uh, lucky because I used to work in in Australia, we may be the king of welding, that is John Norrish, I don't know if you know him. And he's able to look to the day, welding data and say, oh, this happened, something strange happened here. Here there is maybe a lack of fusion. But just because he's the king of welding, he's a 90 years old guy. No? The idea is try to transfer the John Norrish knowledge in a machine. And you see, for example, square biased learning techniques. So you are going to collect every day, all the data and say, okay, John, what is this, what is this, what is this? And John Norris is going to create for you the labels for the machine. And we are going to create a sort of digital twin cyborg of John Norris. Is that yourself? Or you can use unsupervised learning machine if you know that some process parameters are good in terms of no defects of the machine. Which is the difference between this these two approaches is that supervised learning machine requires John Norrish that is close to you that is going to create labels for you. And John Norrish is very bored to do this activity also because 
we prefer to go in Bondi Beach to have a swim instead to spend time with me. And so another, the other approach that you can use is unsupervised learning. So you are going to get all the information from your process, go give them to a, in a machine in some way, I'm going to, to show you how, and just make it work the machine to understand when some start, strange sounds going to happen. Another detection that is uh, this field of machine learning, let me say, of su semi-supervised learning. I say semi-supervised because you are not going to give knowledge labels to the machine. So technically, it's an unsupervised learning technique. But the, the data that you are going, that you are, you are feeding your algorithms are just data that come from a normal process. So it's a sort of data-driven, semi-supervised, non-supervised, unsupervised approach that you can use for data detection. Because the idea is that the machine is going to learn a pattern of normality in your data. And then at the end of the day, if something strange is happening, the algorithm is able to say, oh, here there is something wrong. The, the algorithm that I use for one of the applications are the visible component analysis that is used to reduce the high dimensionality input that comes from our process. So let me say you are going to collect data from different, uh, different sensors and you can create a low dimensional approximation of all this high dimensional input with a linear transformation. And you can use an uh, inverse transformation to reconstruct the data that you compressed. So, since you are going to learn a linear transformation to compress and decompress optimally your data, once something wrong or something anomaly comes from the process, the algorithms they, they give to you a very high reconstruction error. Why? Because the algorithm, algorithm is created on normal data. One class of Roberto machine is another machine learning algorithms. Another interesting algorithm that you can use could be, for example, density-based algorithms in which you are going to compare the data that you are going to get from your process respect to the data that are stored in a database correlated to normal behavior of the process and looking to ratio between what observed in the average these key, key labels of new, of new samples coming from the first process you can classify it like an anomaly or not or you can use isolation policy techniques the technically are three base techniques that, that in which the aim is to separate all the data of your data set. And the intuition here is that if a data is very different respect to the other, it requires less split to be isolated. So, machine learning, why are cutting manufacturing? What we need? So, we need some, okay, uh, this, we use uh, this robotic. Uh, station, that's our station, is a satellite 10 axis robot with all the external axis with a link core welding machine. We de deposited some uh, welding beds of carbon steel materials. So what? And we collected with high sample frequency acquisition system the welding voltage and the welding, during, the welding current. Uh, during the deposition. So, you can see here, for example, in the, in the both part here, two uh, data that come from a normal deposition process. So, we deposited some beds and we get a lot of data regarding normal deposition, okay, without defects. After we introduced some defects in our system, some fault, like, for example, reducing the, the gas shield of welding, and we get this data from the process. Now, they look similar. In some points, they look different. You can see that, you know, that there is something strange that happening here, also here, but, which is the point, that to detect a defect as a human, what you have to do is just be able to analyze a, a data with five kilohertz, it's impossible. So the only stuff that you can do is just give this information to a machine and just say, okay, 
this is normal, this is normal. Once you are going to get something like that, are you able to form uh, an anomaly? Now, we get a lot of data, but we go, we collect data from our sensors. So we have a time series, no? We have some data that come every, let me say, you know, with this key, five kilohertz sample rate. So we, in one second, we collected 5,000 uh, data. And it's impossible for a, for a machine learning algorithms just uh, working with 10,000 data in input. It no makes sense, also because they are data that come from the same process, and blah, blah, blah. And to, do, to work with thousands of data, you need a very powerful uh, hardware. So what we used, what we did was just extract features from the data. So in every temporal window of one second of acquisition, so uh, we initialized a buffer, we collected 5,000 samples in this buffer, and when the buffer was full, we extracted these features from this data. Skewness, kurtosis, mean variance, some statistics from this collection of data, and some uh, features that come from a process-based future of frequency domain analysis. For example, for the water signal, we extracted uh, the peak amplitude or the peak frequency of the frequency response to a fast wave as well. And other stuff for the comment. So, starting from 10,000 data, we reduce this data in 12 features. And we feed our algorithm, our, our algorithm with these features. So, at the end of the day, we were able to develop a noise detection module with 19% of accuracy using this local outlier factor algorithm that in one millisecond is able to, to give us an, an idea an output and this output is related to anomaly or normal deposition process. So since we are going to collect this information from the, our process in a determinate time state, we can relate it relate this output with the two center point of our robot and we can say, oh look that, this region maybe there is something wrong. And in this manner we have the certification process. So if you have questions about that, I'm here for answering you. But this is my day. The most important stuff that I want to tell you before I conclude, conclude my discussion of today is I come from Italy. Uh, and we are very, very open to guest some PhD students or students in general from other countries of the world. Uh, I was speaking yesterday with my supervisor about the speaking of today. And he told me, oh, it's fantastic. Invite them to come to visit Naples. So especially for professors today here, if you have some PhD student that could be interested in machine learning stuff, machine learning applications also for your process. Because I know that you are not going to win. It's no matter. Just uh, you want to give them the possibility to go overseas, to, to go deeper on these kind of topics, and just you know, eat pizza, also. a good pizza, the real one. Uh, we are very open to guest, the guest your students by university. Okay? And I'm not joking. So whenever you want, we are welcome to Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Engineer Julio, for your wonderful sharing. Yeah, wonderful. <laughs> a bit more technical sharing, I assume. <laughs> All right. Ah, too technical. Yeah. Ah, I'm very sorry for that. <laughs> uh, okay, can I open for any Q and A? Yes. Where is the pizza shop? <laughs> uh, this one is Solbino. Uh, maybe it's uh, one of the best pizzeria in the world. Come there, it's amazing. Yeah, so it's also my favorite one. It's, 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 it's
<laughs> but some one of you used to work on this topic before? No one of my children in this room? No one? No, just one? And you student? Okay. Uh, I mean, was that the event British also for the conference in Singapore? So I just want to ask one, one very simple question. You, you were telling about certification and uh, all that thing, right? So this is wire arc additive manufacturing. Can we apply the certification this um um distinct on like normal fuse deposit modeling additive manufacturing method? Uh, or is it more specific for no, no, it's, it's, uh, you can apply these techniques also for FDA. The problem is that you must have the same source to collect the data. The problem of FDM, especially the cheap one, they, they are very close machine, I guess. And it's not, it's sometimes tricky get information about the temperature or I mean, the food rate in solenoid to, to, to get the heat input. And they're just, you know, those are loops stuff, you are not able to access this information. But, of course, if you can do it, uh, Okay, great, thank you. So I would like to in uh, yes, another question. Uh, yeah. What's the difference between this kind of machine learning and like the machine learning that we students sometimes use like chat GPT? What's the difference between the algorithm and all? Uh, it's a bit, the chat GPT is trained with a uh, machine learning learning technology that is called reinforcement. So it's different because there you have not really, it's a, 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 it's a mix between supervised learning and reinforcement learning. And also the structure of the real network that you use on the chat GPT is different because it's a transformer or based on a transformer. Uh, it's a completely different aspect all the stuff that I presented. But the, the concept of the, the basic are the same. Uh, the problem is that for chat GPT you must have giant, data center somewhere, giant hardware to calculate the answer of your GPT somewhere with cloud computing and blah, blah, blah. With this industrial application, they are more specific because you are just saying, okay, task is anomaly detection, task is regression of the two year, the two, blah, blah, blah. The task is prediction of the power consumption of our uh, people. The neural networks or machine learning are going to have to use a very simple as they do. So GPT is really complicated. It's a very simple stuff. So, yeah, but you use you use some time machine learning? Uh, just sometimes for extra ideas, you know. Yeah, but I mean for the application part, not just GPT. <laughs> <laughs> I mean no, me I'm are real 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 interested in uh, learning in my final year and all that. Uh, yeah. Maybe you have my my email. No, I don't if you have any question, materials, or if you are going, you are going to be to a to follow some courses, you can speak with me because, um, for example, in the UAW now I'm going to do a PhD student uh, course on machine learning applications. Maybe once I'm going to come back in Italy for the professor is you can invite me also remotely to speak about this kind of stuff you are interested in. Or, anyway, if someone who is interested, you can send me there to the anime and share whatever you want. All right, thank you so much. So, thank you so much, Engineer Julio, for your wonderful sharing session today.